name is Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Catherine Boyer. Her work is focused on the ecology and restoration of coastal habitats, primarily salt marshes and seagrass beds. She's particularly interested in how species interact to structure their environments and influence fundamental ecosystem processes such as nutrient, nutrient cycling. Such basic ecological research has important implications for the restoration of damaged habitats. Today we talk about seagrasses. So first, thank you for your work. And second, thank you for being on the program. You're welcome. So what slash who are seagrasses? Well, seagrasses are a group of flowering plants that live in the oceans, as the name suggests. Um, they There are about 50 different species that grow around the world, and uh, they're different from each other in terms of how they look and exactly how they act. But for the most part, they have long blades, and they go with the flow in the water, and um, so very flexible blades that um, provide habitat for all kinds of different organisms that, that otherwise wouldn't have a place to live in the oceans and also provide all kinds of other services and, and uh, functions that, that we value, such as clearing the water, um, you know, taking up nutrients, uh, sequestering carbon, all those kinds of, of things that, that we value as humans. We hear, we hear, I've heard them spoken of as, as basically underwater meadows. Is that, is that reasonably accurate? That is accurate. Some are more continuous uh, beds of, of, of blades coming out of the sediment. So they look more like meadows in that way. Others are more patchy. In San Francisco Bay, for example, our beds are very patchy. The plants are quite large. And they tend to not grow um, in really close proximity to each other. There could be, you know, uh, a meter between each patch that might be a meter in size. So uh, depending on where you are, it can be more like a meadow or more like um, a patch of, you know, a series of patches of blades. So just to be clear, um, when people think of of bladed bladed beings growing in the ocean, they might think of of kelp. And we are definitely not talking about beds of kelp. This is a completely different species and completely different class of creature, correct? Creature, creature, creature of class of being. That's right. Yeah. So kelp is a kind of algae, and algae don't have roots. Um, they have hold fast, so they grab grab onto rocks, and uh, they don't have a system of uh, what we call a vascular system, like you know you think of in, in humans even with veins and plants, flowering plants. Um, the, the plants have a, a system of, of, of veins that move materials up and down through the tissues. Uh, it's called the xylem and the phloem in the plants, and that's what seagrasses have. So they are actually true flowering plants, whereas kelp is a kind of algae. It's a, it's a whole different group of organisms. So for seagrasses, they all have roots, and those roots, uh, you know, are used to take up uh, moisture and and nutrients from sediments, which is not something that kelp does. So what sort of what sort of um, what sort of uh, I'm sorry, what do we call the ocean bed where they live? Because if if it were land, it'd be called soil. So what 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 substrate? What what do they grow in? What what's that called? Well, you could call it soil, but we call it sediment. So it's 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 soil material. It's soil particles like clay and silt and sand um, that have accumulated on the bottoms of bays and estuaries, and we call those sediments. So it's a sedimentary process. It's accumulation of of these soil particles um, at you know at low positions on a landscape or seascape. And those build up and those then provide the, the place for the roots to, to grow into for the seagrasses. And how, how deep in the water are, do most seagrasses live? Well, that really varies. So it depends on how much light there is. So if the water is really clear, seagrasses can grow in many meters of water. You know, they can grow 10 meters down. But in places where there isn't a lot of light that penetrates, so say there's a lot of sediment particles in the water or there's a lot of small single-celled algae we call phytoplankton in the water, that blocks the light. And if that's the case, these plants are rooted in the sediment and they're sitting there, you know, hoping for some light, to put it in, you know, very human terms. They need that light for photosynthesis. 
So if there's a lot of material floating around in, in the water column that blocks that light, then the seagrasses can't grow as deeply. So, for example, in San Francisco Bay, where we have a lot of uh, sediment in particular floating around in, in the water column, there is very poor light penetration. And that means the deepest that our seagrasses grow is a, a couple of meters at most. So, so what is the what was prior to, to seagrass habitat being destroyed? Are, are seagrasses all over the world in in are, were they widespread, and are they widespread? They are widespread. Um, they occur in in temperate and tropical places. Um, they occur in, in in very cold places as well. Uh, so they they are very widespread. Pretty much any place where there is shallow water uh, where there is also some protection. So you tend to not find them on an open coast that gets really beaten up by waves and wind and, um, you know, that, that kind of high energy condition that you can, you can picture along an open coast. You know, so think about places where there's some protection. So bays and estuaries and lagoons where there is uh, seawater that comes in, but it's not coming crashing in. Um, so seagrasses need flow. They need water flow. They don't like to be in really still conditions because they need lots of exchange of water. Um, they need clear, fresh, you know, not fresh as in salinity, but fresh as in clean water. Um, and that means that you find them in, in protected areas where there is, there is good water exchange, but not uh, with such high wave energy that it would rip them out of their habitat. And because they're in bays often, does this mean that they are often uh, not in the saltiest of water, but they also like brackish water, many of them? They can take some some lower salinities. So if you consider seawater is about 34, 35 parts per thousand uh, salinity, you know, many seagrasses can, can live in those high of salinities, but they can also live in salinities down to, say, 15 parts per thousand. So in estuaries and, and bays where there's a, a mixing of fresh water and, and salt water from the tides, they can live up into the estuary to some extent. So, you know, you, if you move uh, further up the estuary than where you might find, say, 20 or 15 parts per thousand salinities, you'll start to find other submerged vegetation that we tend to not call seagrasses because um, for obvious reasons they're not in seawater anymore. They're in something much fresher. Um, but those are the the counterparts of the seagrasses that, you know, they continue to march right on up through the estuaries um, into, into completely fresh water. Um, but other species than, than what we call seagrass, we call them just submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV. So before we get to um, the larger seagrass communities and also to uh, threats to seagrasses, there's, there's a couple, a couple more just, um, technical things I've been really wondering. One of them is how does how does pollination work? Because they're they're pollinated plants. I I understand insects. I understand wind. I don't understand how pollination would work underwater. Well, it is surprising to a lot of people to know that plants can pollinate underwater. Um, they do uh, seagrasses do produce pollen, and that uh, floats in in the water, and that is how. Uh, the pollen moves around and, and you actually get pollination. Um, so it's surprising, I think, to a lot of people that that can, that that can happen. And it is just uh, by water motion that that pollen gets moved around and, and the plants get fertilized. But uh, there is some evidence, some, some pretty cool work that's been done on a seagrass species in uh, Mexico where it appears just through time-lapse photography, uh, it's been shown that, that some small invertebrate species, little um, isopods, amphipods, those sorts of little shrimp-like animals, uh, may be moving the pollen around similarly to what bees would do you know, in air on, in terrestrial plants. Um, so we don't know still what the extent is of, of that contribution of animals to the pollination of seagrasses. It might be small, uh, but it's not, it's not nothing. <laughs> we do see evidence of it, um, but it is probably mostly from just movement of the pollen in the water. 
So when I was researching, doing the research for this interview, I came across something, and let me know if this is incorrect, that these plants are kind of the plant equivalent of marine mammals in that they didn't evolve in the ocean as such, but they evolved, they came on land and then they went back to the ocean. Is that accurate or am I all wrong on that? No, that is correct. They, they did start as land plants, um, some in, probably in fresh water and some in saltier water that, you know, you can have salty water on land, um, you know, depending on what the geology of the location is. Um, and so, yes, it's happened multiple times uh, through evolutionary history where uh, these different species are not even all that closely related to each other. You know, I told you there's 50 species. I think there's 12 different uh, genera, you know, different genuses of of seagrasses, um, which is a which means it's a pretty diverse group that managed to perform the same act of of uh, migrating back into the ocean after being a land plant. So seagrasses are um, home to other beings as well, are they not? Are, don't they make larger? Uh, aren't they parts of larger communities, which include um, the little shrimp-like beings, f fish, etc.? Yes, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons we we do restoration of these of these habit seagrass habitats. It's one of the reasons why we're really interested in conserving them. Um, there are all sorts of little critters that live on the on the seagrasses, and those can be snails of, of various sorts, some with shells and some without. Um, there can be those little shrimp-like animals, like we mentioned, called isopods and amphipods, and um, just a, a wide variety of, of, of small critters. And then, you know, move on up from there through the food web. The things that eat those um, gravitate toward the, the seagrass beds in order to, to find those, those sources of food. And then, you know, so we call those the, you know, meso predators or the meso grazers and meso predators. And then we get the larger predators, um, say, uh, larger crabs and fish that'll come in and eat those sort of mid range size species that eat the small little amphipods and isopods. And then, you know, keep on moving up through the, the, the larger sizes in the food web. And, you know, you'll get, uh, birds such as herons and egrets. Um, that that will eat the the fish and the the larger crabs, um, and so it's it's the the basis. The seagrasses really are the basis of a, a very complex food web that um, you know that that serves a, a whole variety of different species. And I I seem to remember I don't remember if this is on your website or if I read this somewhere else about uh, there is sometimes a um, uh, a relationship between seagrass beds and mangrove areas where the babies might grow in one and then move to another for rearing. Is that accurate? That is absolutely accurate. Yeah, there's been some interesting work that's found, um, particularly with coral reef fishes, large coral reef fishes, that if they are, um, if the coral reefs are adjacent to seagrass beds, and especially if those seagrass beds are also adjacent to mangroves in these tropical areas, that those places in the mangrove roots and in the seagrasses where the, the younger, the juvenile stages of the, of the fish can live and hide and find things to eat and grow up a little bit before they move off into the coral reef where it's a more dangerous place, um, that they're more successful by the time, you know, they, they grow up and move off into the coral reef. So there's this value of having these adjacent habitats and these complex habitats where the small versions of these animals can live and, and grow before they move out into more treacherous areas where they're going to find predators. So there, there's one, there's another topic that I want to, I want to touch before we, before we move to some of the threats to seagrass. And one of them is, um, the topic I want to touch is, um, I have read, I don't remember what the figures are, but I've read some extraordinary figures on the capacity of seagrass beds to sequester carbon. Yeah. So we know some, some about that. There's a lot of work going on. Um, on that topic right now in seagrasses around the world. And there are some tropical seagrasses in particular in the Mediterranean region that 
have a tremendous capacity for storing carbon. Um, they have these big, almost like peat reserves, like you would find in some kinds of wetlands. Um, but these are under, you know, under the, under the water and the shallow waters. And those, those plants, those particular species have a tremendous capacity for, for storing carbon. Um, there are others that we know less about and that we suspect because they're a little bit more ephemeral in their nature. They kind of come and go and they spread and some of the shoots die while others are growing that they probably don't store as much. So it's a, it's a definitely a hot and ongoing research topic to try to understand, um, you know, which species and where there is that capacity for the seagrasses to really perform that function in a big way. We know they all are sequestering carbon because they're photosynthesizing, they're taking carbon um, out, of, out of the water, and, you know, they're building their tissues with that carbon. And so they all are sequestering carbon for sure, but, you know, whether or not they're they're doing it in a large way compared to say terrestrial trees, um, you know that's that is something that's still that's still being investigated. You said two words that reminded me of another of another question. Is one word was Mediterranean, the other was ephemeral, and I I seem to recall a while ago reading about a seagrass bed in the Mediterranean that some people think is one of the oldest beings on the planet is like older than bristlecone pine. Does it sound familiar? It does. Yeah. There've been some genetic studies that have shown that there are some seagrass beds. And I don't know if this is the one you're referring to or not, but that they are like a single being, you know, they, they are a single clone and they have lived for a very long time and they have spread, um, you know, but the, a blade or a shoot from, from one end of the bed to the other, and it could be, you know, kilometers across, uh, is identical uh, genetically to a blade at the other end of that same bed. Um, so suggesting that, that these are very old and, um, that they've been in, in place for a very long time spreading and providing that habitat. So what, what are some of the threats to well how are how are we you you said that seagrass beds often are in bays and estuaries and um oftentimes bays and estuaries uh are where people put cities yeah right and oftentimes cities are then associated with um pollution and disturbances to the bay itself and so what are some of the threats how how if we go if we had a time lapse time lapse map of healthy seagrass beds over the last 500 to 1000 years would we be seeing a shrinkage and movement in the wrong direction and if so what are what are some of the primary threats well, you're absolutely right that these estuaries and bays and lagoons that occur along our coasts around the world are often the places where people want to live. And so there are many threats that come along with that, that just the human cohabitation with these same environments where, where the, where the seagrasses live. And so yes, in many places, there has been a decline in the acreage of the seagrass or the overall health of those beds. And that can come from simply habitat destruction it can be from you know for example dredging through a seagrass bed in order to provide access for boats to marinas and that sort of thing um it can be you know when we build bridges and when we build tunnels and uh, when we put structures uh over water that would shade the plants uh things like docks and marinas um you know we we do have those kind of direct uh, impacts on on the acreage that there might be of a seagrass in a particular location, you know, and then on top of that, we, yes, we landscape, we, we have our agricultural uh, use of fertilizers and those bring nutrients, um, particularly nitrogen into these waters that uh, seagrasses didn't evolve with. And that can often lead to algal blooms, which can, um, the, the algae can grow on the leaves of the plants themselves uh, it can grow loose in the water and, and shade those those seagrass plants. 
Um, so there are many places where nutrients themselves have been um, a huge detriment to, to seagrasses and, and, and how much acreage there is and how healthy they are. Um, yeah, so, so lots of, lots of different, uh, impacts, uh, in, including other things like invasive species. So, um, in some of these coastal areas where we do a lot of shipping, you know, we bring invasive species and vertebrates like I was referring to earlier, the, the amphipods and isopods. There's a number of examples of, of invasions of those from places, um, far from, from the, the location we're talking about. And those come in and, and now don't have predators that are used to them. They, they, uh, can, the populations can, can explode and we can have damage to the, to the seagrasses uh, due to them. Now, that's something we've experienced in San Francisco Bay with a non-native, an, an invasive amphipod that has come in from other places. And, uh, instead of eating just the algae on the leaves, which is typical of that amphipod in its native habitat, it eats the plants it's themselves and can, can really devastate, um, particularly the, the fruits and the seeds, uh, remove huge amounts of those, uh, from the plants, but also eats the leaves. And so it can be quite damaging. And it's something that, is a problem for us actually in San Francisco Bay when we're trying to do restoration because sometimes we go to collect those flowering shoots that we use to get um, to produce new uh, seagrass beds using the seeds and those seeds have all been eaten. <laughs> um, and also we'll see these outbreaks of this amphipod in the places that we restore and we bring the plants in and we remove the amphipods as best we can before we do the restoration. But those amphipods still find their way to the new restoration site and then eat the plants. So those kinds of things, those, those movements of, of animals around can be, uh, can be very detrimental. There's also invasive uh, examples of invasive seagrasses, um, coming from different places that humans have, have, um, facilitated the movement of and then those species that don't belong there are competing with the native species of seagrasses so that's a variety of examples i'm sure i could think of more if i if i spent long enough uh pondering it um, but but many things that humans do um, in these coastal areas that have negative impacts i'm wondering about what? i'm sorry go ahead please no no that's that was it I, i'm wondering too about dams because i know that um that dams uh, deprive the lower rivers and then also the ocean of a lot of sediment. And so, for example, when they took out the dam up on the Elwha, up on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, there were some uh, rocky beaches that were only rocky beaches for the last 100 years, ever since they put in the, the, um, the dam. And as soon as the dam was taken out, it refilled with sediment and that... Uh, um, brought back all sorts of species who were supposed to live on the sandy beach there. And so I'm, I'm wondering, too, since these live in sediment, if dams are also um, causing a deprivation of sediment for them. Yeah, well, that is a, it's a really interesting issue now, the whole management of sediment and the availability of sediment as we think about sea level rise. You know, because we know the oceans are rising and that includes in these estuaries and bays like I'm talking about where these seagrasses live. And as the water levels uh, rise, you know, these plants may or may not have the opportunity to migrate upslope where they can still get light, um, depending on, you know, whether there actually is migration space, you know, a gentle slope that's not developed at the top. Um, so, you know, we're interested in this issue of, of is there enough sediment, for example, to allow the plants where they currently are to raise an elevation, you know, right where they are living, um, so that that, you know, they can, they can still persist after the, the sea level rises. Um, in San Francisco Bay, we've had a huge input of sediment through the gold rush period when there was the hydraulic mining of the Sierra foothills. So that's the blasting of the, of the hill slopes to, to remove gold during the gold rush year. So from 1850-ish, you know, up until about the year 2000, we had a tremendous amount of sediment coming down through the San Francisco estuary. 
and allowing some of these shallow areas to build up in elevation and keep pace with sea level rise that's already occurring. Um, but now we're seeing this clearing of the water and we're very concerned about whether or not the seagrass beds and the, the wetlands that are a little higher in elevation will be able to, to keep up with sea level rise because they're not going to continue to have this influx of sediment. So it's an interesting thing, right? Because it was a, a human caused source of sediment, but we got used to that over a hundred year period or 150 year period. And um, that became the new normal for this particular estuary. And then, you know, when, when that stops and now, like you were talking about dams, a lot of the, the remaining sediment that was coming off those hill slopes is back behind dams um, all around the, the Bay Area. And so that means that those sediments are not coming down um, and not uh, supplying that, that elevational capital, if you will, to allow the seagrass beds and the wetlands to, to raise in elevation as the sea level rises. And there's examples of that sort of thing where humans have gotten involved in, in the management of, of sediment and, you know, either through damming or hydraulic mining or other kinds of activities. And so depending on where you are, um, it could be a very different situation in terms of whether there will, there will really be enough sediment to keep up with sea level rise as, as it proceeds. You know, you, you said earlier that, um, the, the seagrasses seem to be have very specific requirements as to how deep they can be based on how much light comes through the water column. And that reminds me of something, for, for whatever reason, I wrote maybe 100 pages on the various mass extinctions in a book five or six years ago. And until I did that research, I was just like everybody else that I pretty much thought, okay, so, you know, maybe a meteorite hits or something and, and then it changes, it makes it so it gets really cold and the dinosaurs die. That's pretty much as much as I thought of it. But I remember reading that every single mass extinction, a significant part of it has been with a change in sea level. And as soon as I read that, it made perfect sense because those areas are some of the most fecund on the planet. And then when you put that together with the seagrass being able to live at, let's say one species can live between two and four meters, you know, if the sea level rises two meters and that runs into rocks and can't, can't have soil there, that whole community is going to die. That's right. Yeah, and it, it means in a lot of places where we're thinking about what's going to happen as the sea level continues to rise, you know, there are, there may be places where we don't have any opportunity for those kinds of habitats, um, over time. So say, say in 50 years or 20 years, those places may run out of space. Um, and then there's other places where there is migration space. And so it's, it means that managers and people who are thinking about how do we maintain these habitats, uh, within the estuary broadly, um, you know, thinking about where can we focus our attention? You know, where can we get the most bang for our buck really in terms of our conservation dollars to enhance or restore or encourage these, these habitats to be able to do that migration? That could be, you know, buying up adjacent lands or, you know, preventing development in certain areas or conservation easements and that kind of thing. We're really focusing those efforts on places where we think there is the room for these habitats to migrate, uh, as opposed to our shorelines where we've built right up to the edge and we have seawalls and we have riprap and, and, and we have no opportunity unless we're willing to take out our human infrastructure to, to allow for those habitats to move. So before we talk about um, your your beautiful phrase of repair, enhance, and encourage um, seabeds. Um, can you talk about your relationship to seabeds and I mean seagrass? I'm sorry. And um, how did you? Why seagrass and not butterflies? What 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 <laughs> is it that draws you to seagrass? Well, I was like many kids who thought that the the oceans were an amazing place when they were growing up and thought they would be a marine biologist and study whales and dolphins or maybe sharks. And uh, 
along the way, I realized that um, whales and dolphins and sharks and sea otters and all those things that, that are um, so appealing to humans, um, first of all, there isn't room for everyone to study them. There's only so many, so many positions in, in which to do that. But um, on top of that, those, those, you know, highly charismatic species are fed by all the little things in the ocean. And the little things in the ocean are what started to fascinate me. So, you know, the plants that harbor the amphipods that, you know, that are eaten by the crabs that are then eaten by the birds, you know, uh, as, as you go up through the food web, it's those little things that, that run the whole system. And it became fascinating to me that, you know, that this, this was the case and it wasn't obvious to me, you know, growing up and taking my early science courses and thinking about what it meant to be a marine biologist, that that was really a path for a marine biologist to study the plants, for example, in the water. Um, so I became interested in that, um, much more recently than when I first became interested in marine biology. It really took, uh, until I, I was at, out of my undergraduate um, program and into my graduate work where I, I realized that my, I wanted my focus to be on those habitat forming plants, um, including the salt marsh plants, but um, eventually the seagrasses that were so fascinating to me that with, without them, you don't have the habitat. You cannot support all of those higher organisms. So they're just absolutely critical. And um, that became my focus then. How can we conserve them? How can we restore them? How can we create these these places where everything else can thrive? And that's been my motivation now for my 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 whole career since my PhD. You know, when we when we put it this as, as bluntly as you just did, it's it's also obvious. You know, how can you expect other creatures to survive when they don't have a home? You know, it's it's like. How can we expect, of course, of course, on land, you know, meadow larks are going to start going down in population if you kill all the meadows or monarch butterflies are going to if you could kill all their food. And it's just it's the same with the seagrass that that they're the the sort of foundation upon which everybody else rests. That's right. We call them foundational species. I don't know if you knew that, but that is a term that, that we use for for seagrasses and, and kelp forests and um, a number of different uh, habitat forming species. They don't have to be plants. I mean, corals are an example of a habitat forming species or mussel beds, you know, so those could be animals that form the habitat, but, but they really do, we call it a biogenic structure, you know, through their bodies, they, they provide the habitat for a whole host of, of other organisms. So in, in your bio, there's the, there's the line about, how species interact to structure their environments. And are you meaning that in the terms you've been talking about so far, that basically just providing habitat? Or are you also meaning that in terms of, um, I know for, for prairies, you know, prairie grasses build tremendous amounts of soil. And I mean, is how, how are you meaning that when you say that you're interested in how species interact to structure their environments? Yeah, I'm thinking about those biological interactions between species. It could be plant to plant or animal to plant or animal to animal. But through the, through that biological interaction, how do they influence the, the physical aspects of that, that environment? So like you say, you know, how do they trap, how do they trap soil? How do they, um, accomplish nutrient, um, retention and, and removal from the environment? You know, so, how important is it that each of those species is present in order for that physical process to actually occur? And so I'm, I'm really interested in that, in that aspect of the biology of these systems, not just the biological interaction, but how that interaction ends up influencing the, the physical aspects, what, what the architecture is of that, of that habitat. So how big are those plants and how much do they sequester carbon and how much do they trap sediment and nutrients and that sort of thing. So it's, it's really that juxtaposition of that biological interaction and that physical response that um, I get really fascinated by. You know, about 10 years ago, I got really obsessed with the question of 
of who's in charge and thinking about, and I mean that loosely, and thinking about various, um, how parasites affect the behavior of their hosts, like the ones that, that certain snails will get and then it makes them crawl to the top of a, a rock and wave themselves around to attract a bird because that's the next one who's going to eat the parasite. And there was <laughs> one, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just laughing. <laughs> and and I was, there, there was one in specific that had to do with, with bays that blew me away. It was, it was a type of parasite who is, I believe, eaten by a snail, who's then eaten by a fish, and it causes the fish to go up and flash its belly. And what that does is make it easier for seabirds to eat, which is the next step. And so seabirds eat it. Seabirds then poop the parasite back out. Snail eats the poop and starts over. And the, the reason I bring all this up is because the thing that blew me away is at some point, somehow, somebody had done a study where they found that if you remove the parasite, the whole system falls apart because um, without the, the fish swimming to the top to flash their bellies, it's too hard for the seabirds to catch fish. So basically, the parasite ends up driving everything. And that... That, that sort of uh, secondary and tertiary effects that we don't think about immediately just blows me away. I'm thinking about this just in terms of, of how species interact to structure their environments. It's just, I'm, I'm just marveling at nature, that's all. Well, and you can turn that around too and think if it's important that you have all of those connections, um, all of those different um, exchanges of the parasite through the different levels of the food web, you yeah, you know, something that, that people like me do is look in a restored site or a site that um is damaged and we look to see if you find the parasite um present in all those different levels. Right? So so we know that they're important enough that if they're lacking, that there are functions that are lacking. And it tells us that we have not successfully restored, uh, for example. Um, so there's a there's a a parasite that that infects snails in in salt marshes, for example, and and if you don't find that parasite throughout that that food web, those number of different steps where that parasite normally travels in order to complete its life cycle, um, then you know that you have not successfully restored that 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 tidal marsh habitat. So, talk us through how. Or just just tell us a little bit about your efforts to restore, enhance, and encourage. Um, I, I love that phrase. Um, um, seagrass beds. What 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 do you do, or what do other people who are working on these issues do? Right. Well, um, in San Francisco Bay, that's that's where my work is focused. We are. We are attempting to restore a particular seagrass called eelgrass, and it is it occurs in about uh, 3,000 acres of the bay right now, but we think there's the potential for it to occur in about possibly 30,000 acres, you know, an order of magnitude more area. Um, and that's based on um, biophysical modeling, so modeling that has looked at you know, the, the depth available, the light penetration, the flow, um, a number of different conditions that we know are important for seagrass growth and, you know, predicted where we ought to be able to have this particular species of seagrass, the eelgrass. And we use that then to, to, as a, as a starting point anyway, to say this particular location in San Francisco Bay ought to be able to support eelgrass and it's not. So let's start there. And we bring in eelgrass that we've collected from other locations, natural eelgrass beds, and we either seed it or we transplant it. And I can tell you about the ways that we do that, um, if that's of interest. And we, we establish it in this new location in very small plots. And we watch them and we let the seagrass tell us whether or not um, that's a suitable location. So we could measure all different aspects of the soil conditions and light. Um, and we've done that, you know, very uh, grossly through this biophysical modeling work. Um, 
So we, we have some sense of that, but we don't bother to do the really detailed measurements at a specific location. We plant the seagrass and we let it tell us, you know, is it, is it going to be able to grow in that location? And if it does not, we, we move on. And sometimes there are places that the models suggest we can get eelgrass established and, and the plants don't grow there. And there's other places that, that, that we've been quite successful with. So we plant the plants and we're, we are working to try to expand some of these restored areas to have eelgrass and locations in the bay that uh, we haven't had um, in the in the length of time where we've we've known where the seagrasses are. Um, so you know it's not like we have great historical information about where eelgrass was within San Francisco Bay. Um, so that's that's a big lack. And and in fact we are not that interested in where it was in the past because we know that the bay is very different than it was in the past from sediment deposition from the hydraulic mining like we talked about but also because we've changed the whole configuration of the bay. So we're more interested now in saying, well, where can it grow today? Not so much where did it grow in the past. Where can it grow today? And we are working <laughs> diligently to try to establish it in those places where we think it can grow. And let's say, let's say that you, you start a new plot tomorrow. I don't know if that's what you call them, you, you, you plant some seagrass tomorrow or the right time of year this year. And, mm -hmm. um, and it grows and does well. What would be a realistic best case scenario for how quickly that could grow? So you, you plant something that's, well, first off, how much do you plant? How big an area do you cover? And then second, if, if things went just great, how, how big could it be in 10 years? That's an excellent question, and we don't know the whole answer to that yet. Uh, we've been working on this for a number of years now, um, and the largest plots that we – and plot is a good word – the largest plots that we have uh, installed or, or transplanted or seeded um, are about an acre in size, and – when you think of that acre, don't imagine that it's wall-to-wall eelgrass within that space. It's not at all. We plant it very uh, sparsely in that space so that it can spread and fill that space and so that we have to collect less from natural beds that we're trying to conserve. Um, so best-case scenario, um, that acre would, would fill in with the eelgrass, you know, within a few years' time. Um, and it – we have not seen that happen yet. We've definitely seen expansion of eelgrass in places where we've planted, but we have not gone, we haven't been doing this long enough to see it uh, fill in the space um, in the way that we would hope it to over time if, if we can watch these, these plots for longer. And if you have it in there for five years, have you started, or however many years, and it starts to fill in, have you seen... Um, other ha, have you seen the return or, or have you seen the associated species is a phrase i'm looking for i guess associated species coming into that area then yeah it's interesting most most species that we expect to see will find that new eelgrass plot within a sh very short period of time and that's not surprising for species that have, uh, so for example, invertebrate species that have planktonic larvae, you know, so imagine uh, a crab, for example, that has a larval stage that floats around in the water. So when its larvae are dispersing around the bay, it finds a habitat, it just sort of happens upon it, and, you know, Voila, it, it, it stops and, and, and decides to, to live there. But there's other species that we call direct developers. And those are species that, you know, for example, some snails that produce baby snails that look just like the adult. And those snails don't disperse around within the water column. And so they have to crawl to the new location. And so species like that don't show up as fast. Um, some of them show up faster than we would expect, but others after five years aren't there. 
And we're now, we've now been doing this long enough that uh, we're figuring out which of those species, even if they don't have planktonic larvae, are still somehow managing to arrive at these sites without our intervention and others that are not. And so we're thinking about now, you know, should we be bringing those species in? There's this really beautiful sea hare that has, it's green and has stripes on it. It's like a snail without a shell, a long, you know, <laughs> gelatinous looking animal. Uh, it gets to maybe an inch total in length. And it lives on the seagrass blades and it eats the algae off the seagrass, allowing more light to come to the seagrass. And that particular species doesn't show up at our restoration sites on its own. And so knowing that it's beneficial to the seagrass, we're starting to think about, well, maybe we should be moving it in there and allowing it to do its job. Maybe we'll have more successful restoration at these places if we do that assisted migration. So we have about about three or four or five minutes left. And I think everything you're saying is really important and really interesting. And for people who recognize the importance of of seagrass to the world and to those those habitats it seems it's it, it seems like a harder habitat to directly like i have friends who love buffalo and they can work on buffalo field campaign to to try to protect buffalo and i know people who love other species and they can protect habitat it seems one thing to file a timber sale appeal to protect a piece of old growth forest, but how, if somebody starts, if, if somebody listens to this interview, they go, wow, this is really cool. They start reading up on seagrass. They fall in love with seagrass. What, what can they do? How, how can, how can we help seagrass? Well, I mean, it's, it's obvious how you can. <laughs> Well, there are a number of things that people can do. You know, they can participate in these restoration projects as they're going on. It's not for everyone because these are, are difficult places to work. Um, you know, they're windy and there's strong currents, you know, not like the open coast like I was referring to, but still. Um, you know, some of these places we can only access by boat and some places we have to crawl through mud in order to get to these seagrass beds. Um, so there are opportunities for people to volunteer, but um, usually those are for uh, more hardy souls, uh, except for the work when we're when we're actually collecting the seagrass and we rig it up on various. We have a couple different ways that we we take uh, seagrass that we've collected and we attach it to bamboo stakes or to popsicle sticks. We have these various ways that we then do the transplantation and we do that on land. And so people can participate in, in that regardless of their ability to, to get around through mud and in water. Um, so we just do that in, on land at the Romberg Tiburon Center. Um, so that's one thing that people can do. You know, they can also support, um, you know, when there's opportunities to vote for, um, for measures that, that promote restoration. Um, they can vote for those and they can, they can decide that they're willing to tax themselves in order to, to provide for this kind of restoration work. Um, that is a lot of the, the funding that goes toward doing this kind of restoration comes from bond funds, um, in the state of California anyway, um, or from different measures where we have property taxes that, um, that then contribute to restoration work, including of, of seagrasses. So yeah, there's there are things that people can do with their pocketbooks and their and their 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 ballots, um, where they don't have to get anywhere near the water um, if if that's not their thing. They just appreciate these habitats. So are there are there people who are doing um, equivalent work to yours in Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf Coast where people could, if somebody's living in Alabama or Nova Scotia or Louisiana, and they want to actually do some hands-on work, are there places they could probably find to actually come and volunteer, like you're saying, in the Bay Area? Absolutely, yeah. So you mentioned the Chesapeake Bay, and there are programs there to restore the seagrasses. Um, the coastal bays along uh, Maryland and Virginia have been have a hugely successful seagrass restoration program going on there that has utilized a whole lot of volunteers. 
um, along the Gulf Coast where there was the Deepwater Horizon event. Um, there's a lot of restoration going on where there's opportunities for volunteers. And that's true throughout the world. So people just need to make a little bit of effort to see what's going on in their area, and I bet they would find opportunities. Well, is there anything that you wanted to say about seagrass I haven't given you opportunity? Well, one thing that, you know, I think that there are a lot of people who don't even realize that this is something that's in the water because they don't see it. Um, and there are not just seagrasses, but a number of habitats where the people are just not aware of. And I encourage people to go out on the lowest tides that they can. You know, there's these great um, you know, apps that you can get on your phone, for example, that tell you where the, the when the tides will be at their lowest point during daylight hours, you know, and you can go see, you can see where that might be in your, in your local area. And go out at those lowest tides because that's when you'll be able to actually see these habitats. And I think if people see them, they'll understand so much more about what they can provide and how valuable they are. When they're underwater at the high tides, you know, the general public is not aware of them. And so I think it's it's hard to make the case to the general public that they should do anything about these kinds of places. So if we can get them out on those low tides and they can see them and they can explore them, I think um, we'll find more support. Well, that's so great. And thank you so much for your work and thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Catherine Boyer. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.